yesterday. Well, we saved a pretty doggone interesting thing here for the near end. We've also got the R&D uh, update after lunch, of course, but right now we have the privilege to hear from the three members of our congressional delegation. They are all here in person, folks. And uh, we are going to start with the uh, senior member of that delegation, uh, Senator John Hoven. Uh, on January 5th, 2011, he was sworn in as North Dakota's 22nd U.S. Senator after 10 years of service as our state's governor. Among his committee assignments is a seat on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He's also in the appropriations business, so that's kind of important too. Throughout his career at the Capitol and uh, in, the, in both capitals, as a matter of fact, Senator Hoven's been a strong supporter of an all-of-the-above energy policy, including coal-based electricity, quite naturally. As governor, he started the Empower North Dakota Committee and uh, promoting the state interest in that fashion. So please welcome Senator Holwin. We'll introduce all three here. Well, let me introduce you guys too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Heidi Heitkamp is uh, the junior U.S. Senator from North Dakota. She succeeded uh, Senator Kent oh, Conrad following the November 2012 election. Senator Heitkamp successfully sponsored a bill that will increase R&D resources for coal-based generation to capture CO2. Heidi uh, also served as North Dakota's Attorney General, for those of you who've been around, around a while, back in the 1990s, and as a former state tax commissioner as well. As Attorney General, she represented the state in uh, one of those battles with Minnesota over externalities and won that case. And by the way, she's also a former board member of Dakota Gasification. So please welcome Senator Heitkamp. I think we lost some audience. What do you think? Yeah. And Kevin Kramer is North Dakota's lone member of the U.S. House of Representatives. He was elected to Congress in the 2012 election and has been re-elected every two years since then. Kevin's worked closely with the industry to terminate or reduce onerous regulations such as the stream protection rule. Kevin's a former member of the North Dakota Public Service Commission as well and held the Mindland Reclamation portfolio during that time. So. He's no stranger to the lignite industry well, as well. So please welcome Kevin Kramer. <laughs> hey, we're, uh, we're going to uh, give each of the members uh, kind of an opportunity to give kind of a top of the mind speech, what's on your mind, what's happening, what's hot in Washington right now. And uh, we're going to start with you, Senator Hoban. So please, the floor is yours. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's an honor to be here with the uh, North Dakota Lignite Council and uh, with Senator Heidkamp and Congressman Kramer, thanks for all that you do. Uh, it makes a tremendous difference, not only in uh, supplying energy for this great country, uh, but the, the jobs and the innovation uh, as well. Really, nobody produces energy with better environmental stewardship and leads in terms of that technology uh, any better than we do here in North Dakota. And it's, it's not just uh, that we're an energy powerhouse, we're finding ways to link to agriculture. And so building on our traditional agricultural base, I mean, we've been an ag powerhouse for this country forever and everybody knows it. Uh, nobody does farming and ranching better than we do. Uh, but now we're truly an energy powerhouse in so many different ways. And uh, obviously in terms of coal-fired electric, that's certainly true. Uh, what you do every day. But this, this synergy, you know, th these synergies that we're creating with this amazing uh, technology now extends between energy and ag in such a great way. And of course, I'll just give one uh, example that's uh, coming on uh, line right now is the half a billion dollar uh, fertilizer anhydrous ammonia plant that we have at Dakota Gasification. So our farmers, instead of having to go to Malaysia to get their anhydrous and their urea, to get their fertilizer, where you know we're last in line to get it, and you have all that transportation cost and everything else. Now you know we're going to make it right here. Uh, you know, utilize that uh, natural gas uh, that we have, low-cost natural gas that we produce here, and basin, of course, using the uh, um, incredible technology development we have at uh, Dakota Gasification Company, uh, producing. Uh, top quality fertilizer for our, for our ag producers, not just for North Dakota, but for the whole Midwest. That's the kind of innovation that grows our economy, that not just creates jobs, but also higher paying careers that bring young people back here, that keep young people, great young people, in this state because of that incredible opportunity. So thank you for that. And of course, our job is to work to support you and help you do just that 
And that's why I kind of start with that big picture, because our role really is to make more of that happen, help you make more of that happen. So when we work on 45Q to get an a enhanced tax credit for carbon capture and sequestration, uh, when we work on things like my Regulatory Certainty Act now, which harmonizes the regulatory treatment between the IRS and the EPA so that we can actually utilize the 45Q in class six wells, oil wells, right? We have to be able to do that. So we can have the 45Q, that's fantastic. We enhanced the value of that tax credit, that's good. But now we have to be able to use it. So we've worked long and hard, going back to my days as governor uh, in North Dakota, on getting regulatory primacy in North Dakota, where the state regulates the uh, injection of CO2 downhole in an oil well for tertiary oil recovery and long-term storage, okay? Uh, we're the first state in the country to get that because we have that regulatory regime put in place uh, working with our legislature. We did that. And now if we can pass the Regulatory Certainty Act where IRS and EPA agree on these regulations, then you can put the CO2 downhole for tertiary and long-term recovery meet the EPA requirements and meet the U.S. Treasury requirements to actually get the tax credit. Point here being, of course you guys can do this from a technological standpoint, because every single day you're driving that technology curve forward. But you can't do it and lose money, right? It's got to be not just technologically viable, it's got to be commercially viable. And so when we combine the tax credit and a revenue stream from secondary or tertiary oil recovery, we now make it not only technologically viable, but commercially viable. We do it here, more energy, better environmental stewardship. Everybody around the nation adopts it. And guess what? They adopt it around the globe. And we have a solution. That's the real solution, not more regulation. The real solution that comes from American innovation and ingenuity that you do every day. So when we work to get funding for Project Tundra, back-end retrofit on a plant, which we did last year, we did it again this year, so we're in good shape, you can apply for that funding. Or front-end funding for Alum Cycle, where we build a new state-of-the-art coal-fired electric plant that's very, very low emission, okay? Those funding sources, those efforts, the ability to help support what you're doing is what really our job is every day, and, and we're absolutely pleased and honored to do it. All yeah. right, thanks, Senator Hoban. Um, okay, now, folks, folks, I want you to recognize what a rare opportunity this is, really, to have all three members of your delegation here on stage. So get your, get your questions ready. Get your questions ready. We're going to have an opportunity here. We're going to give uh, Senator Heitkamp the floor now to, uh, to tell us what's on her mind, what she'd like to share. So please. Um, I think I want to start out with maybe a little bit of a history lesson about how innovative and creative um, your industry has been and how every step along the way it's been this amazing partnership of innovation whether it involves the state government whether it involves um, the service companies or actually the utilities or the mining companies and so i want to start out by kind of taking us down memory lane a little bit when you think about the severance tax and the fight that we had in the early 80s on the severance tax and we had a percentage severance tax went to a flat rate tax um, uh, in the mid 80s and something kind of remarkable happened because Governor Sinner said look based on my experience on farm checkoffs we found that it's been really valuable to have a pool of funding for innovation for research and so he demanded when he moved off the uh, the percentage severance tax to a flat rate tax that there be a set aside, a certain uh, number of cents per ton that would be put into a fund, and that became the Lignite Research Fund, run by the Industrial Commission. And then when we had clean air challenges back in the um, early 90s, and Senator Quentin Burdick was still with us, he was able to um, fight back some of those clean air standards while we were given time to meet uh, some of those standards, whether it was NOx and SOx, whether it's particulates, whether it's mercury. And, and so every time there was a challenge put in front of the industry, that challenge was met. And it was met and exceeded, given the right time and given the right opportunity. And so when you think about um, what happened uh, in the 90s when I was the Attorney General and we were challenged by Minnesota on externalities and uh, then John Dwyer who has been such an excellent um, partner 
for all of you and an excellent leader in this area said, look, we need to not only just have the resources and the, res the, the industry there, but we also need the state of North Dakota to explain how important this is to our users, to our utilities, particularly our co-op utilities, and what will happen with prices. And we were able to get a good result out of the Public Utilities Commission in in uh, Minnesota that time. But I, I talked to John and I said, look, let's not fight this fight anymore. At the time, we knew how, how, in, how the public in Minnesota felt about the coal industry. I said, we need to put some of that money into a promotion fund for what we do, and that's how Partners for Affordable Energy was, was formed. And then we go into the challenges that we have right now. As you've met all the kind of traditional pollutant challenges, we get a case out of the Supreme Court that says that the EPA is required to take a look at CO2 um, as a criteria pollutant, figure out a path forward. Unfortunately, that path forward was an absolute absurd um, a result coming out of EPA that once again the industry stepped up and the industry said we cannot meet these requirements, this is ridiculous. In North Dakota it will basically require that we shut the door. But then something comes on the heels of that which says look, we understand that long term this is an issue and a problem we need, we need to address. And, and, and the problem, you can argue about whether it's a, a problem, uh, environmental problem, whether it's a political problem, whether it's a perception problem, but we know we're going to live in a carbon constrained environment. Going to the future and, and you know, one of, the, one of the challenges that we have all the time is assuming today that the environment that we're in politically today will be the environment we'll be in in uh, two years, the environment that will be in in eight years. And I think most of you have seen this, this uh, parade come and go, and you know that you need to provide for the long haul. And so rolling up our sleeves, working with an incredible coalition, which um, got great support here, but really coming up with the concept that we could get you know, the, the, the most conservative uh, pro-coal folks in, in the Congress, along with some of the most aggressive um, climate controllers in the Congress, Sheldon Whitehouse and Mitch McConnell and John Barrasso and Heidi Heitkamp. You think about who all came in this 45Q debate. And, and one of the big challenges that we had in getting 45Q across the finish line is really getting people to believe that this technology was not pretend that this technology was real, that given enough opportunity to develop this technology, given enough running room to, to bring in other industries to work on this technology and commercialize it, that we could in fact um, uh, do what we needed to do to become a so-called clean energy source. And so 45Q was more than just a tax credit. It was introduction of how we are going to develop our industry further, how we're going to keep coal in the mix for electrical generation well into the future. I love your, the name of your conference, 800, year, 800 years of energy waiting to be tapped. Affordable energy, reliable energy, re, re, redundancy is what we've always provided in this country. And so as we, as we work on not just the tax credits and the great um, things that Senator Hoven was talking about, we've been able to introduce this opportunity as a real technological opportunity and get people to believe that we can get it done. And so 45Q is more than just a tax credit provision. It is a public policy statement that as a country we are going to invest in carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration techniques. And the piece of this, you know, we've been, you know, most of you know I served on the board of directors for Dakota Gas for, you know, almost 12 years. And in that role, I watched as that, that organization adapted. Every time there was a challenge in front of us, whether it was a dollar gas, two dollar gas, we innovated with a new byproduct, including CO2, which we didn't do as an environmental control, we did because it was, in fact, absolutely necessary to keep the, the plant open. And now, as Senator Hoven has said, we've moved in to urea, We've, we continue to, to find the ways to make that miracle on the prairie, which is what I call Dakota Gas, continue to be viable and available and continue to work on the technologies that will serve us well into the future. But our challenge today continues to be getting 
a, a vision for the future that, that we can ad all, all agree on as a matter of public policy, regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, that that's the path forward. And that's the wonder of 45Q, because it's not only a tax credit, it is a vision for the future. Now, where do we go from here? Senator Hoven's right. We need to take a look at some unique financing provisions, whether it's master, master limited partnerships. We need to take a look at um, uh, the coal fines issue. We need to look at new source performance standards and, and whether we, we need to um, uh, basically allow you to do the adaptations that you need to do without triggering um, additional EPA regulation. There's tons of work still to do, but don't miss an opportunity to celebrate this milestone because I think when we look back and we're still producing electricity from coal 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this technology, at this opportunity as the pivotal point that kept coal in the mix of generation of electricity and did it in a way that was responsive to concerns, did it in a way that actually guaranteed a future. And so I'm very excited. I've been to Petronova where they're doing amazing things that includes enhanced oil recovery. I was just over at Occidental Petroleum where they're doing with CO2 a huff and puff technology in shale play. I've been up to SAS Power and saw the events there and saw what they do. Been to Norway where they are really leading the charge on carbon capture and sequestration technologies. And so um, this is real. This is not phony. This is not some you know, pie in the sky. We just need to now use the North Dakota innovation, whether it's a Lignite Research Council, whether it's responding to externalities, whether it's partners for affordable energy, whether it's the work that you do in advocacy. We need to get reach in there, we need to pull it out, and we need to continue this march on the right path. And um, I'm very excited about um, the direction we're headed. Thank you. So Thank you. Okay. As, uh, as we invite uh, Congressman Kramer to give his remarks, I would ask Dave and Steve to uh, lasso those microphones and start waving them around out there <laughs> so folks can line up with their questions, because I know there are going to be a few. And uh, if any of you would like a bottle of water, I have one over here, or two or three. Anybody? Uh, any takers? No I'm Marco Rubio impersonations. <clears throat> we had one of those this morning. So far, so good. All right. Congressman Kramer, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And. Um, so, as I recall, your question uh, was like sort of top, what's on top of the mind? What's, what's the buzz around Washington? Well, let me tell you, on the Energy and Commerce Committee this week, the big buzz is Mark Zuckerberg's coming to testify. And who cares about Lignite, right, when Mark Zuckerberg is going to come? I don't even get the big deal. So Facebook collects a lot of data, and they use it for targeting advertisers. But anyway, I guess it's a big news story. I'm looking forward, actually, to having him in my sights. But, but... Um, the real important work, uh, and there's a lot of it in, in, on the committee, but the real important work that's relevant today is a, a, an initiative that we started this term out with in, in uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and that is the Powering America initiative that uh, we've been undertaking. And that's involved a lot of uh, hearing, a lot of testimony, a lot of research on, on um, policy, research on technologies, you know, wh where are we headed as an, as a, an economy. And it's involved everything from, from you know, obviously, electrical generation, mining, um, reclamation. It's also involved a, uh, a lot of work on um, fuels for vehicle fuels, everything from ethanol, obviously, to uh, the abundance of oil and gas and electric cars. And where's everything going? And it's been quite a year. It's, it's good to be us, let me tell you that. It's good to be us. And I, I, maybe what I would do is start with... Um, sort of where Senator Heitkamp left off and what Senator Hoven was focused on when, he, when they were talking about 45Q. <clears throat> and the, the importance of it as a policy statement certainly is true. Um, the ability for, for Occidental to use it down in Texas is, is a great experiment, but Senator Hoven is exactly right. We have got to pass either in, in a tax reform part two or some other must-pass piece of legislation, the uh, CO2 Regulatory Certainty Act, so that we can apply it to what we know best. Now, who wouldn't love to reconcile the EPA and the, and the, uh, and the Department of the Treasury or the IRS's definition so that we can utilize the credits for carbon capture and then utilization for tertiary oil recovery? And where better to do it than right here in North Dakota? 
because who wouldn't love a technology and a policy that enhances the life of a coal mine and the life of an oil field? That's the kind of efficiency and innovation that's always given the United States its edge. Now, there are lots of people that I know in Washington uh, in the, and uh, from other parts of the country who hate the idea of both of those outcomes, the expansion and the extension of the life of a, of a coal field and an oil field. But the reality is that we know the importance of um, baseload electricity continues, and it will always be with us. I was disappointed, although not shocked, when FERC rejected Secretary Perry's idea of a resiliency plan that recognized the, the value and recognized in, in terms of rate um, recovery the value of baseload electricity. It was interesting that one of our hearings one day, we had a whole bunch of smart people in front of us, and um, the very basic question was asked of all of these experts, can you describe what baseload electricity is? Not one of them could, could describe baseload until we got to the nuclear person. And she said, it's very simple, 24 hours, seven days a week. There's only two fuels that do that. Gas could do it, but nobody wants a gas pipeline to take the gas to the, you know, to, to the, to the power plant in many parts of our country. And those two are coal and nuclear. And they're the two fuels that the left hates and is trying to get rid of as fast as they possibly can. And so while FERC rejected the Secretary's resiliency plan, they did take on, take on the topic themselves, which I think we need to watch carefully and we need to be part of, because we have got to recognize before it's too late the value of baseload electricity. And yes, in that process, the innovators, in fact, I appreciate Heidi's um, history lesson because when I think back to my, to my years, both as an economic development director and a regulator in North Dakota, one of the best parts of the job that satisfied my intellectual curiosity the most was sitting on the Lignite Research Council, reading the peer review analysis of the newest and latest technologies, and um, you know, listening to smart people talk about it, and then, of course, making the recommendation to the Industrial Commission um, what, uh, what investments ought to be made, and seeing that innovation come to, to reality here. There are a couple of other challenges, though, as we look for those next level commercialized technologies. We have the basic research, we have some of the policies and other things that we have to pass to, to make it happen. But the, the, the leap from basic research to commercialization is a big leap. And this demonstration piece that I think both senators have talked about is oftentimes what's underfunded. That's why things like 45Q and making it relevant and more accessible to more technologies is important. But in addition to that, our government has to continue to make direct investments. And that's why you know, I've been disappointed, frankly, in, in some of the president's budget proposals that cut back on the R&D at the DOE. It's why we've all fought and been so far successful in maintaining a lot of the DOE R&D um, grant dollars. But we need the, the uh, aggregated resources of the taxpayer to help get that bridge built between basic research and commercialization. And, and uh, the EPA's own rules require, as you know, demonstration. And so, uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in that front. One other area I want to get into a little bit, because I think it's, it's again, it's another one of those areas. We, we like to talk about how we're going to save coal. It's important to save coal. We need to do everything we can to make coal clean and relevant, as well as um, you know, continue as, as a prime baseload fuel. But our electrical policy has a lot to do with that. Obviously, when I talked earlier about the, the Secretary Perry's resiliency project, the trans, uh, transmission resiliency project, recognizing the value of baseload, that, that, that's a, an important piece of it. Um, when I dared question some of the experts on, uh, who, who fought back against that because they, they kept saying, well, you know, FERC and, and the RTOs, the regional transmission organizations, are set up as markets, and markets have to take the appropriate price signals. And, and all of that's well and good, but if you separate the incentives in, that have been created outside of the markets for other competing fuel sources, then you're ignoring the whole picture. And uh, one of the areas of review that, w that we're taking on is PURPA. Now, PURPA is one of those dinosaurs from the 19, early 1970s, Public Utility uh, Regulatory um, something, Powers Act, that, that requires certain things that were relevant in a, in, a, in a different era when there weren't competing and very, very competitive competing um, 
fuel sources. I think the whole, the whole idea of PERPA is worth questioning, whether we need it at all. But certainly, the abuses that we've seen from some of the competing fuels, 200 megawatt wind farms that are suddenly 10, 20 megawatt wind farms that require the utility to purchase from them, regardless of, of whether they need the, uh, the power or not, or whether it actually enhances conservation or not, um, is just blatant fraud, in my view. And, and we need to empower the local regulators, the state regulators, to look into it. We need to be able to break up some of that, that fraud that's taking place. And if we don't threaten it, they're not ever going to do it. In fact, um, when I have the wind guys come into my office and I challenge them on PURPA and I challenge them on, on these archaic rules, they get very upset very quickly. And then I look them in the eye and say, do you really think it's appropriate that you can take a 200 megawatt wind farm, turn it into 10, 20 megawatt wind farms so that you can force the sale of uh, of your product on somebody you're forced to purchase and of course they have to admit that it's it's not right so we've got a lot of areas that we can talk about I think that the time is more yours than it is ours we want to talk about what's important to you and if you have any good questions for me to ask about Facebook data I, I'll take them to the hearing uh, this week right. thank you congressman <laughs> okay folks now um, at, at the risk of asking an elected official to be brief, I'm going to ask you to try to keep your question, your responses to the questions in the 30 to 60 second range to, to maximize the value of our time here. And I've got Steve over here and Dave over there with microphones, so start waving them around. Since we don't have one off the top, I'm going to ask the first one. We heard, we heard from Dave Glott yesterday, and we heard that the administration is working on a replacement for the clean power plan. Um, so kind of maybe a two-part question if you can cover that in 60 seconds. What would you expect from that? And thinking back to the days when we were first debating this, isn't that Congress's responsibility, not necessarily the EPA? We don't directly have a mandate to regulate carbon dioxide. Shouldn't that be the role of Congress? By your way, Senator Hover. Uh Jeff, well, yes, of course. And part of the reason EPA is going down that trail, though, is because it's based on the court decision where they have to have a replacement in order to rescind the Clean okay. Power Plan. That's why okay, they're doing okay. it that way. Good. So, uh, and I think Glad had it right, um, subject to hearing from all of you, you're the experts, but you know, he talked about having a SIP, state implementation plans, rather than FIPS. And you need to do that because you know, we produce energy from many different sources across this vast nation in many different ways with many different characteristics. So the federal one-size-fits-all does not work. And we've learned that, it doesn't work. And so to empower a state like North Dakota with the most innovative, creative industry you know, in the world, as I talked about earlier, that's what we should do. In other words, let's accomplish this objective by producing more energy using the most advanced technology and getting the better environmental stewardship in the process. That's the very innovation and creativity we want to encourage and foster. So laws and regulation should help encourage and foster that innovation and creativity I was talking about earlier. And then we'll go to town in North Dakota in North Dakota and do a fantastic uh, job. I mean, we're number one in the nation in reclamation. We show how well we uh, can do these things. And so that's the right approach. And then some other part of the country can do something really amazing and creative in some other area of energy. The states under our system of government were set up as the laboratories of democracy. That's, you know, uh, Article 10 in the Constitution. Let's use it, right? Brent Sanford, you're for that, aren't you? Okay, LT. So I think that's the right approach. Okay. Senator. Well, we'll start out with um, the discussion of the Massachusetts case. So the court ordered the um, uh, evaluation of whether CO2 should be regulated under the Clean Air Act. The administration took it back, made, it, made what they called an endangerment finding, and that led to Clean Power Plan. Understand this, the, this administration has not reversed that initial determination. And so they now have to come up, unless they're going to re revisit that decision, they have to come up with a plan that is going to, to work. We know, I mean, we spent hours in, in meetings with utilities, with Basin, with Minn Kota Power, with the MDU, talking about it would work if they just did this. We could, we could get where they want us to go. They need to give us more time. And we need to deploy different kinds of techniques. And so what I hope will happen 
is that we will have that discussion, as Senator Hovind said, about state-based solutions. It gets a little tougher when you're a regional generation and transmission organization like MDU and, and, and based electric and even Minn Kota Power, so you need to work across state lines. But all along, we had a plan. We were working towards that plan, and then we got hammered with clean power plan. And all that work went off to the side because they weren't willing to listen. This administration is willing to listen to what our ideas are, how we're going to meet these goals and these objectives, and we can get there. And so the last thing we need is 20 more years of litigation, because 20 more years of litigation will basically put the cap on investment. If we don't have this problem solved, there's no one on Wall Street, there's no one who, who um, runs a utility company who's answerable to their shareholders who's going to make an investment that they think is going to be stranded or in some way shut down. And so let's work to solve this problem as expeditiously as possible, as free of litigation as possible, meeting the objectives that the administration sets out, and that's going to guarantee a much uh, longer glide path to the future for the coal industry. Congressman Kramer, the view from the House. Yeah, so, so obviously it's Congress's job, but in the meantime, it's not like likely that Congress is going to come up with a definition that meets all the requirements and get 60 votes in the Senate and enough votes in the House. And in the meantime, it is imperative that to, the way Senator Heitkamp put it, I think, is, is appropriate, that we have a clean power plan that can withstand the scrutiny of the courts. And until such time as the laws can be changed, that's what we're going to deal with. I think Scott Pruitt's got the right idea, and he's the right guy to do it. And, um, but he's committed the cardinal sin of trying to fix the clean power plan, and so they're dumping on him with all kinds of things. Uh, in the meantime, what, Heidi raises another interesting point about the endangerment finding. <laughs> we don't really know whether or not he'll take that on, but there's been some talk that he might. Uh, that might be, speaking of tough political hills to climb, that might be even, uh, uh, clearly would be, I think, even more difficult. So, precedent setting law is important. Having a, a rule that can withstand scrutiny of the courts is important. What it might look like, I think Senator Hoban's right on point. A state's first regulatory regime is how the country was created and is how the country can move forward, and I think is what you know, I think is what's most difficult to argue against. I would also say this just real quickly. It is difficult enough. I was always frustrated on the Public Service Commission with the resource plans of regional transmission and, and um, production uh, utilities because we're not even like Minnesota, much, like, much less like Massachusetts. And so for resource plans to take into account multiple political venues and, and jurisdictions and cultures is difficult enough at the regional level without applying a one-size-fits-all national agenda. Thank you for that. Um, one of my primary responsibilities as the master of ceremonies here is to keep us on time. And I want you to know, those of you on stage, minutes. you can see the down. clock here. We actually have 20 minutes, not oh, 40. I'm sorry. We have 20 minutes remaining here. Oh, so we're, really? We've got to keep, I don't know why well, we have 40 minutes. Your clock's there. wrong. Yeah. So we have, <laughs> no, that's congressional time. <laughs> So, <laughs> that just means you and I get 20 minutes home and get so the other. Just, just a heads up to you. We're, there we go. We're at 20 minutes. All right. We got, we got 20 the... minutes sounds great to me. <laughs> Sounding better all the time. And for the audience that asked to listen, they probably think it's really great. <laughs> so it's like the referee. Can you, can you reset the clock to 20 minutes? Yeah, yeah. They did. They all right. did. We, we have a question over here from Charlie Bollinger. Yeah. Uh, I'll stand. Um, a couple of things we've been kicking around, and these are both kind of ifs. Um, I've been at this business now for a long, long time. Um, and uh, I raised a question, the initial question is, um, uh, you know, when we started, when, when, when acid rain was the rage 40 years ago, mm -hmm. the best we could do is 60% removal on SO2, and technology took that ball and ran with it. And now we do 95 or can even do almost 100% SO2 removal and have made valued products out of that as well. Uh, my question, which I asked about a year ago at the National Coal Council subcommittee, after I listened to uh, both sides of the argument that we've been listening to for about a dozen years, which is, you know, zero CO2 is what we should have or 90% removal is what we should have. I asked a dumb question, uh, what's wrong with 
is 10% better than natural gas. Um, so I submit that question to you. Um, you know, what's wrong with 60%? The enhanced oil guys get their uh, CO2. Um, everything moves forward. And maybe in 12 years, we'll have the 95% for you as technology evolves. Because I, I know you've seen the graph. And that's a graph that should be on the paper, front page of the paper, which is we've increased generation and reduced SOX right, yeah. and NOx in recent years. And I think we could do the same thing if science is not um, been bound right out of the block, right? So I'll pose that question. Uh, I still keep asking the dumb question. That's what I do. So my other one is that I kicked around this week, too, with some is that if grid stability is vital and has value, then people or generators that bring that stability to the grid, is there some credit given for that? I don't want to penalize generation technologies that don't, uh, but you know, all things being equal, they all supply megawatts, but should the generators get some sort of uh, credit? Shouldn't the playing field, if you will, the, uh, you know, all, all horses in this generation race, uh, you know, uh, play by the same rules? That, uh, those are my two ifs. With that question, we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's reverse the order. Uh, what's wrong with 60% and should the 24-7 guys get credit for reliability, Kevin? I'm, I'm going to answer the last question first in under 30 seconds. Yes. Okay. Yes. There should be a recognition for 24 hours, seven day a week, electrical generation always being there. And the best way to, unfortunately, the best way to help the rest of the country understand it would be if it wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, I had an argument with the guy from uh, New Jersey one time over my um, vegetation plan that tried to keep trees from growing into the power lines, the transmission lines in the mountains, and he would just argue with me that, oh, that's just a back door to, to, you know, to uh, the timber industry on federal lands. And I'm like, you do realize that the blackouts in New Jersey a few years, years ago were caused by a tree in Michigan. There's such a disconnect between you know, how power is generated and how it gets to the, to the light switch in the wall. Anyway, so yes, uh, with regard to 60%, I think you're exactly right. What we've allowed is we've allowed the extremists to define the problem. And politics allowed that for a very long time. It became vogue to say it's got to be 100% or it's got to be 90%. And the reality is there's not been a recognition of increased megawatts and decrease in CO2 emissions. Um, let's go all, all the way back to the definition that, that we talked about earlier. CO2 shouldn't even be talked about as a waste product. It is a commodity in North Dakota. And if we can get getting back to 45Q, yes. Um, and, and so I think it's incumbent upon those of us that know better to talk about it in that regard. CO2 is a commodity like other commodities. It's got value in the marketplace and, it, it's, and we've proven it in North Dakota. And, um, and so yes, Charlie, you're exactly right. There's nothing wrong with 60%, but incremental change anymore. It's, everybody wants to be completely satisfied every day. So it, it's, it's more of a matter of how we communicate, I think. Uh, a miracle happens every day in this country. And it really has taken a long history. But people reach for the light switch, and it doesn't matter what time of the day it is, they turn on a light switch and the light comes on. Now, no one in our, in our country will think that's a miracle unless they don't have it. And we have built the most resilient, reliable electric grid in the history of the world. And you talk about people who lived in Soviet Russia. Evening comes, they're out of power. That doesn't happen in our country. And it doesn't happen by accident. And if we don't refocus our efforts on reliability and redundancy of the power grid, I'm afraid we will not, we will not have that exceptional asset that helps build our country. So we have to have this conversation. Um, when LM was purchased by uh, General Electric, um, I was there at the, the turnover when General Electric came in and took over the plant. And I asked the woman, the engineer, who was um, part of this transition, 
how many years she thought GE was projecting it would take to build some kind of storage for intermittent power, whether it's solar or wind. And she said, we're a long way off. Now, that, we, we don't know when that's going to happen. And obviously, there's a lot of investment going in, whether it's solid state batteries, what, whatever we're looking at. But in the meantime, we have to be myopically focused on the certainty of the power grid, whether it's protecting it against cybersecurity attacks, which we know are there, whether it's educating people, as Kevin has talked about, about why that happens when you turn on a light switch. And, and so I, I think those of us who have served in North Dakota in the various capacities, we understand this industry. We understand what happens. And there's very little appreciation. It's like magic to them. It's like, you know, like no one even planned it. It just happened, those electrons in the wire. And so, uh, you know, part of this is an education system, but the last thing that we need is a disruption which leads to the education. We need to plan ahead of it. Now, on the 60%, I, I just think people have, you know, have, have uh, so little patience anymore for the incremental change which creates the tipping point that leads to the ultimate result. And I couldn't agree with you more that we need to be looking at how do we take these steps that leads us in the right direction? And how do we lower expectations about what's possible, recognizing we need to provide this reliability and this redundancy, what's possible today that will lead to the innovation of tomorrow? And um, I, I will tell you, I've seen, you know, SAS Power who thinks that they're, they're at 90. Um, you know, so, so, so we've, we've maybe, through our discussions of talking about it, we may have, in fact, um, led people to believe that it's commercially viable. We know that it's technologically viable, but we need that commercial viability, we need that investment, and we need to provide the regulatory certainty, because who's going to put that in a 40-year plant without knowing that they, they can recover that investment? And so we've got all these economic challenges along with the technological challenges that we need to, to address. And so um, it just is a process of education, 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 education. And that's you know, a big part of what we do in Washington, D.C., because we understand it may be better than a lot of people. Senator Hogan. I like to refer to Charlie as the mad scientist. I've never seen him angry, though. I know. It's, it's not because he's angry. It's because he's... <laughs> such a great scientist and <laughs> develops all these things like coal beneficiation yeah. um, and because he looks like the guy in uh, help me out the movie uh, back to the future back to the future yeah Knock he's got his delorean past the park i mean yeah. check it out you know when you're having lunch today or whatever <laughs> but you know you answered your own question charlie of course <laughs> of course he did <laughs> the answer of course you know and and we can do it, and we are doing it. But that's, you know, as far as the 60%, and we'll get it. You know, look what we've done on Knox, Sox, and Mercury, what you guys have done. And you do the same thing on CO2, given half a chance, and that's what we're talking about is, you know, give us a chance. That's why we need, though, the Regulatory Certainty Act, and that's why we need to be able to utilize these programs and the funding for Project Tundra and Alum Cycle rather than just talk about it. And, of course, that's why, as Kevin said rightly, some forces are pushing back on my Regulatory Certainty Act because they want to talk about, you know, clean coal technology, but they don't want us to actually deploy it to produce more energy from coal and more energy from uh, oil and gas. And so we need to get those things done so you guys can continue to charge forward and do just exactly what you uh, asked and answered a minute ago. And on the grid, of course, you're right, same thing. And that credit really should, has, to be, has to be there, not only in terms of uh, then having the, the security we need in energy across this great nation, but to build more transmission. You know, we've got to find a way to cut through and build more uh, transmission, and then you need to get some credit when you're out there spending all that money to build the transmission and be able uh, to use it. And uh, so no question that we have to address that, and there definitely should be a credit there. And, you know, Kevin mentioned that uh, Secretary Perry tried to do that, and, uh, of course, we know him well and have worked with him for years, and we'll continue to work with him to try to do that. All right. Uh I think we're going to have your, your responses are probably averaging about 90 seconds. So I think we might have time for, <laughs> for two more questions, maybe 90. Uh, I believe we've got one on this side of the room, and then we've got Al Christensen over here. So on this side of the room, and Senator Heitkamp, you get first shot at this, this answer. Okay. So go ahead over here. Who's got the question? Senator Heitkamp, uh, when Congressman Kramer says that the left wants to get rid of coal and nuclear, 
How do you as a Democrat help change that opinion in Washington? I, 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 where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I, I think that what we need to do is change the discussion. And, you know, what I will tell you is 45Q did it. Because if, if in fact, people really understand and appreciate what's happening, not just in this country, but globally, they know that there has to be a future for coal globally. We have to find that if they, want, if they want to achieve whatever goals they want to achieve on CO2, then we have to have a future for coal. And that future has to be bipartisan. And so one of the roles that I've played, probably more than anyone else, is bringing people together on both sides of the aisle to try and have this discussion about reliability, about redundancy, about fuel source, all of the above energy policy. Everybody in Washington will tell you they're all for all of the above, but they're really not. And then we hear things like beyond natural gas. So we know natural gas is next. Natural gas knows they're next. But none of that works to make sure that we have, we maintain our energy dominant position which has been so critical to bringing back manufacturing. It's been so critical to making sure that uh, our families have affordable energy. And so, you know, I think, I think one of the, the things, because of my background um, and because of the uh, uh, experience that I've had here in North Dakota, whether it's, you know, as the tax commissioner, whether it's on the industrial commission, whether it's um, on the board of directors for Dakota Gas, working with the Basin family, whether it now is, is representing um, this industry in Washington, D.C., I have that platform to say, stop it. You need to understand what we're doing, but the challenge that we have is getting the certainty because right now the average age of a coal-fired power plant in this country, almost 40 years. That is aging um, facility. And how is it going to get replaced? How are you going to go to Wall Street and get $4 billion to build a new coal-fired power plant? Only when you have the regulatory certainty. And so that's why I'm so proud to represent organizations here in North Dakota who recognize, even if they don't agree with the goal of carbon constraints, they recognize that in order to move their industry forward, we need to develop these technologies, we need to make them available. And it seems to me that, that um, when practical people step into the void, not left or right, but practical people step into the void, and they say, we're going to solve this problem. And the problem isn't, you know, we're going to win politically or we're going to win politically. The problem is, how do we maintain an all of the above, reliable, redundant, diverse energy source going into the future for our kids? And how do we do it in a way that will give us the regulatory certainty and the economic certainty that will allow us to make decisions in utility companies, allow us to make decisions in co-ops, allow us to make decisions all the way along. And I think the 45Q is a, is a classic example of where having someone with the experience that I've had coming to people, building those relationships really, really matters. And so I think that this is a problem that's bigger than Democrat or Republican politics. This is a problem of reliable, redundant electricity into the future. Senator Hovind or Congressman Kramer, you want to chime in? Coal should be bipartisan. Uh, any comments at all, Senator? Or can we agree it should be bipartisan? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, and I think, again, I think our industry is doing it the right way. And what we're trying to do is empower, there's that word, I used it a lot as governor. You remember the uh, empower energy plan we had around here starting in about 2002? And that's, I believe it. I absolutely believe it's the solution, and I think... Um, you and, and others in our energy in North Dakota do it, live it every day. I would just add, while in, while in politics and while in Congress, there are plenty, there, there are few Kool-Aid drinkers on both sides. What's more important is that everybody represents somebody. We, we all represent in the House roughly 700,000 people. Those 700,000 people largely look like us. And in the Senate, you know, the senators represent their states, and their states generally look like the senators. And so it's a response to a political marketplace that has been, you know, that has been marginalized, to say the least, that has been separated by miles and miles and miles. And so when Senator Heitkamp talks about, you know, 
practical people stepping into the void to have the discussion. You can have the world's greatest discussion in, in a, uh, over lunch, you know, in, in the Senate or the House or, you know, together, and then you go and take the phone calls and, and suddenly things change. So that's why the role of, first of all, certainly as, as opinion leaders as well as opinion listeners, um, organizations like the Lignite Energy Council and others, why it's so important that they have an ongoing communication plan that communicates not just to themselves or just to those of us who already believe, but help us have this broader discussion in the public arena so the public can, you know, so the public can learn that, um, that all the above means all. I just want to make another point. Politics kind of swings both ways, and you can't predict it. I mean, a lot of people think they can, but they can't. The one thing that we have to do is make sure this doesn't swing so hard to the left. And what you need to do is you need to have goals, you need to have public policies, like we're going to invest in 45Q so we don't get that hard swing. Because if we get that hard swing and we're stuck for four years fighting the fights that we fought for eight years before this administration, we're going to be hard pressed to survive that. And so we've got to make sure that we are stopping, that we're the wedge in that door to stop that hard swing to the left. Okay, Al, right over here, quick question. Very quick question, very quick question is, I really applaud you for 45Q. The problem is that's years away. We need a bridge to get there. I know all of you have sponsored legislation for refined coal to help us. Is there hope for us? I really don't want to see the power plants here be gone before we get to the use of 45Q. Senator Hovind. Yeah, and I, Al, thanks for bringing that up. I uh, meant to bring that up, and I did allude to it when I talked about the mad scientists and coal beneficiation, because that's, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing we're doing. And we've been working to get that tax credit uh, in place for 2018 through 2020, and then it would run for 10 years, and, and so I'm really hopeful that we'll get that. I tried to get that uh, in, in the budget deal, um, just like I tried to get my Reg Regulatory Certainty Act in there, um, and you know, we are getting some pushback, uh, but we need to get that in the tax extenders package. Uh, so I think for all of us, that is absolutely a priority in the tax extender package, and certainly something that I've already started pushing for and will continue to. Thanks for bringing it up, Bill. I had to actually say, 45Q, because there is a 45Q, that they help, you know, helping make that better, make it more relevant, make it more useful, is, you know, gets talked about a lot more. The refined credit, it already exists. To me, that case has already been made. We just need to make the case that the bridge isn't completed yet, and if there's going to be a future, there has to be a bridge. That's why I have the same bill in the House. We're hopeful to get it into, as I said earlier, tax reform. Part two, as I call it, as you know, uh, Chairman Brady and, and the President have already started talking about that. It'd probably more likely be part of an extender package, as John points Senator, to. But Senator, high priority. Right, the We're on it, Al. We we understand and appreciate it. We're gonna we're gonna keep working. We both worked to get it in the Omni. It didn't quite work because it was a little little late introducing the subject. But it is my top priority for the coal industry um, in the next four or five months. Yeah. What they told us, no, that's a tax extender package piece. And that was what we heard. And so that's what we're going to push for, Al. Because we brought a, you know, yeah. we've been pushing this really hard. And uh, but th that was the ultimate argument. But so didn't get it as soon as we wanted, but hopefully that helps create some pressure on them for us to get it in the tax extender package. And, I, and I'm glad to hear what Kevin just said about uh, Chairman Brady and he loves to hear from us, doesn't he? Yeah, he loves <laughs> us. All right, folks, the clock, the clock has gone into the red. The, we Japan, had, the Japanese map is just we, popped We up. actually had about a minute or so <laughs> left, but I knew, you'd, I knew you'd all go over. So we, no, we it says 37 seconds, and you know, yeah. we're yeah. scrupulous about time. <laughs> <laughs> What is going back there? No, no, going, no. Wait a oh, oh, that, this is this. What are you guys doing the back there? Somebody falls, somebody. We had to put some time back. Wrap it up, folks. <laughs> <laughs> now it's flashing. <laughs> it says, "Wake up, yeah. Carol!" Doing. Yeah. Wake up, yeah. Carol! Doing. I got to tell you, Miss Miss K, <laughs> Kayla Co. <laughs> Kayla Co. has been running the show here, and you know what? How about a how about a standing ovation for Kayla Co. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Come on, come on. <laughs> and then for our delegation as well. Thank yeah. you, the clock keeper. All right. Nice. Which way? Thanks very much, folks. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you Get all. Thank boot. you very much. Get the boot.
clock really did down here say, wrap it up, folks. That's all. That's all, folks. All right, we're going to have lunch, and then we're going to have an R&D session right after lunch. So uh, go over, enjoy lunch, and uh, come back for the R&D session right after lunch. Learn more about the future of coal.